Welcome to Faith Church. It is good to have you joining us today. While we're together today, there are a couple of things we're gonna do. First, we're gonna talk to God, and we're gonna do this by singing. Singing allows us to put words to the things that we, we love and we appreciate about God. So we're gonna spend some time doing that. And then we're gonna spend some time listening to God. And we're gonna do that by opening up the Bible because we believe that God speaks to us through the Bible. His words that are recorded there are one of the ways that he speaks to us. So we're gonna talk to God and we're gonna listen to God. And as we do this, it's the way that we, we develop a relationship, a growing relationship with God. He tells us more about who he is and who he says we are. So that is why I am glad that you are joining us today. So here we are at the end of summer and life certainly continues to look different, doesn't it? For some of you, you started back to school this week, whether in person or virtually, but, but that's different. Different than maybe you were hoping or expecting that to be. One of the things that's so great about God is, is that God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so even though the things in the world seem like they are changing all the time, we can have peace knowing that we have a God that never changes. In just a little while, we're gonna take the Lord's Supper together. So either right now or right after the message, I want you to grab the elements that you're gonna to use today. For me, I'm gonna use juice and a cracker, but maybe it's coffee and a bagel for you or simply water and bread. It doesn't matter what you're using. What matters is what's going on in our hearts. This morning, we're wrapping up our series, Life is a Highway, where we've been taking a fresh look at the Ten Commandments. So I don't know about you, but I am ready to worship. So let's go. Yo 
making waters crash upon the sand. The oceans push and pull at your command. You hold the moon and stars within your hands. And all with just a breath, the world begins. Yeah, you are
there is no one like you, Lord. You are faithful. We are grateful for who you are and what you've done for us. But now they fall But you will never fail me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you will never Fail me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never.
promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail The promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands Great is his faithfulness. Today our readings from Psalm 95. It says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. He is our great God and King. He is the good shepherd who cares for his flock and he's the only thing that can truly satisfy us. So let's praise him today because he is so worthy to be praised.
God, it's all about you. You are worthy of the praise. Your grace goes on and on and your love is undeniable. You want a relationship with each and every single one of us. I pray for those watching online today that feel an emptiness, God. You are what satisfies. Only you can fully satisfy us. We can chase after money and attention and fame, God, but it'll leave us empty. You are the only thing that satisfies. I pray that our ears and our eyes would be open to what you have for us today. You are so good. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been amazing worshiping online with you guys today. Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is David Solomon. My family and I have been part of Faith Church since 2011. I thank Pastor Joe and Pastor Brad for giving me this opportunity to share the Word of God with you today. Let's turn your Bibles or open your electronic devices to Exodus chapter 20. We are in the series Life is a highway, and we are going through the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave to the Israelites after he led them out of Egypt. Today, we are going to look into the last commandment. So let us remember that these commandments are the guardrails given by our Lord to protect us from our journey in this world, but not to condemn us. Let us read Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Initially, when I read this verse, I thought, I'm not interested in my neighbor's property, or his wife, or the servants, and by the way, they don't have any donkeys. So I'm good. So I checked all the boxes, and I told myself that I did not break this commandment. But when I started meditating more on the word covet, I realized that it has a very deeper meaning. Covet or covetousness are words we don't use often in our regular vocabulary. In Greek, it means desire or desire for more. We hear this often. If only I had that, then I would be happy. Or I want that so bad. Rockefeller, the millionaire, was once asked, how much money does it make you to be happy? He replied, just a little bit more. Desire in itself, it's not a bad thing. In fact, it is good to desire for a good job, good health, good clothing, and good food. The world is filled with the things that are meant to be desired. The problem isn't in our desire, but our desire for more that makes us to covet. Why? It's because we want something so bad that we are willing to hurt someone or disobey God. It's like we are telling God, whatever you are given to me is not enough. So this commandment doesn't deal with outside condition, but mostly deals with the condition of our heart. First our eye sees it, 
then our emotions takes control over us and allows us to desire and go after the things we see. We often find ourselves driving around neighborhoods, wishing we could have a house like that, or we compare ourselves to the people in the TV shows or magazines, wishing we could have a body like him or her. Or maybe we wish we could have a perfect family that a coworker seems to have. This list goes on. I always had a fascination for cars. When we started our family, we traded our car and got a minivan within our budget. In a couple of years, I saw a newer model and I wanted them so badly. I convinced my wife that this new van had more space and more safety features. It was so hot in the market that we had to wait for a month to get it. The smell of the new car and the smooth ride quickly faded away when a high month, monthly payment kicked in slowly. As soon as I realized I made a mistake and we ended up selling the car within a year. It is a human tendency that we always want something better or something more. God's Word talks about this condition to desire for more in many places throughout the Bible. For example, we can see it from the beginning with Adam and Eve. When Eve was tempted by Satan, she sees the forbidden apple, and in her heart, she desires to acquire the knowledge and to be like God. Like it wasn't enough for her to be known and loved, but she wanted more. We can see another story in Joshua chapter 7. God tells the Israelites, when you win the battle over Babylon, don't take anything from them. But this guy named Achan, when he saw the shiny and beautiful things, he wanted them so badly and coveted them. Bible also warns, how a strong believer in Christ can easily fall into temptation. For example, we can look into the life of King David. This was a man who truly loved the Lord and wrote the Psalms. God says he is the man after my own heart. God's anointing was on him and he gave victory over all his enemies. One day he was supposed to be leading the army in the battle we can see in 2 Samuel chapter 10, he stays in the palace. He lusts after Bathsheba, commits adultery, and to cover his tracks, he plots to murder her husband and gets him killed. By this act, he not only broke of quite a few commandments, but it also grieved God's heart. Like he said, God, what you were given to me is not enough. I want more. Even though King David had everything the world could offer, he had fame, wealth, power, authority. He had more than one wife and more concubines, but it wasn't enough. So what about us? What satisfies you? Or let me ask a different question. What are you going after that you think when I get this thing, I will be satisfied. We think when I get a bigger house or a new job or more children or a new relationship, I will be satisfied. Will you? Do you know someone that who seems like they are always dissatisfied? You could give them an all-expense-paid trip to the Caribbean and they could still complain about the heat. So we can see when we are not satisfied with what God has given to us, we can easily fall into the sin like King David did or even get addicted to drugs, gambling, or drinking. Do we not see this kind of conditions today in our society? These conditions not only affect the individuals, 
but it also affects the families as well. So, what is the source of our satisfaction? I noticed something. Often when we start to follow Jesus, we really get excited about it. We think he is everything I'll ever need. We have the fire and zeal to live for Christ. But I've seen in my own personal life that over time that fire slowly dies and I start looking around for the things that could satisfy me. Christ follower, is Jesus still enough or do you need more? I think Jesus has this beautiful way of explaining why we start to look for satisfaction everywhere else. He says from the Gospel of Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus says to deny ourselves. But the reality is that we are very consumed with ourselves, aren't we? We once thought Jesus has everything we need. Then we start to desire for security, health, uh, or wealth, or comfort. When we get it, we still, we're still left with wanting something more. Deny myself doesn't mean that I need to isolate from the world and forsake all human relationships. It's something very different. Apostle Paul has a great way of explaining what it means to have everything we ever wanted in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. Apostle Paul is not saying that we need to go and crucify ourselves. He's talking about the inner person I. It is my self-righteousness, my self-trust, my self-pity, my self-will, my pride, my greed, my arrogance, my short temper needs to be crucified on the cross. The, all the selfish desires of more needs to be crucified. The I of myself must be crucified. The next part of the verse says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Is Jesus Christ enough for me? The life that he has given to me is enough? Or do I need more? Or am I trying to hold on to the old I, the desires that I had for so many other things? The next part of the verse says, I live by faith. It is very hard to live by faith. It is by faith I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It is by faith I, my old person, is crucified with Christ. It is by faith that I died to sin with Christ. And it is by faith I am a new creation, raised with Christ. Our source of satisfaction is Jesus Christ. So Jesus offers a way out to overcome the desire for more of this world. Listen to what he says in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 37 to 38. That anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. When our desire for more starts to rise up, when we feel the spirit of coveting or envy or greed starts to overpower us, Jesus says, come to me. I will give you everything you need. Underline the word, come to me. It is an invitation from Jesus. My desire of more of this world needs to be changed to the desire of more of Jesus. So the truth is, the world has two 
too much good stuff to offer. Some good, some not good. So how do we beat the trap of having this attitude, God, what you have given to me is not enough? Bible tells us or uses this phrase by renewing of our mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. We need to reset our hearts and minds, and we need a renewal. Let's look at a couple of practical ways to renew our minds. First, renewing of our mind by the Word of God. We renew our mind when we dwell in the Word of God. Psalm 119, 10, 11 says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's not just read the Bible. Let it soak into our hearts, into our minds, into our bones. Also, we can see in Ephesians chapter 5, as the fresh water cleanses our bodies, God's written word washes us clean deep down inside our souls. It, it purifies our thoughts, scrubs our motives and our minds as we observe it and obey its truth. Secondly, we renew our mind by seeking God every day through prayer. This is one of the important things that most of the believers fail to do in our walk with God. We pray to Him occasionally or when we are in need, but not every day. Ravi Zacharias, one of the greatest thinkers, says this regarding prayer. If you are a praying Christian, your faith in God will carry you. If you're not a praying Christian, you have to carry your faith and you will get exhausted trying to carry it. We need to discipline ourselves to be alone with God in His presence. Go to a closet or find a quiet place and seek Him every day. Dear brothers and sisters, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, with thanksgiving and praise and worship. Let us confess our sins and repent from our sins. We must ask the Holy Spirit to search us deeper and reveal any hidden rebellion that we may have or any sin that we may have. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to sanctify us every day with His Word and with His truth. Jesus says, but your Father in heaven knows what you need even before you ask Him. As we seek Him every day, let us not stop our prayers with our needs. Let us move forward asking the Holy Spirit to know more of Jesus. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to give us the spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation that, so that we can know more of Jesus. When Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, when they are in wilderness, these people start complaining, making idols, and fighting each other. They look for satisfaction in material things. Instead of joining and reasoning with the people, Moses pitches a tent outside of the camp and sought God and spent time in His presence. He is crying out to God for his people and asking him, Lord, teach me your ways that I may know you more. Let these people know who you are. As he spent time in his presence, our heavenly father reveals to Moses, I am the Lord who is so compassionate and gracious God. I am the Lord who is slow to anger. I am the Lord, your God, who is abounding in love and faithfulness. Dear brothers and sisters, let us desire for more of Jesus. 
As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, in order to gain the knowledge of Christ, he considers the knowledge he acquired to be a great scholar as dust and nothing. He doesn't want the book knowledge. He wants to gain Christ. He wants to know him more. And he wants to know the power that resurrected Christ. I encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, let us grow in his grace. Let us grow in the knowledge of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. As we long for Jesus and seek him every day, we will become like him and able to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we bear fruit, we will experience the fullness of joy and the everlasting peace in our hearts. Our innermost soul will be satisfied. Our outward craving will be quenched by our inner satisfaction. I close with this thought. In John chapter 7, verse 38, we see Jesus invites us to come to him. As we seek, as we seek him, as we drink from him, he promised the spring of living water flows within us. Christ blesses with abundant river of living water so that we will be source of blessing to others. What a promise and what a blessing. As we desire for more of Jesus, we will not only be satisfied, but we will be a blessing to our families, to our neighbors, to our community, and to our church. So again, let me ask you, what satisfies you? If you had everything you wanted, would you be happy? Jesus only can fully satisfy you. As we end this series on the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments are about the vertical relationship between us and God. The next six commandments are about our relationship with each other. These two relationships, the vertical and the horizontal relationships, meet at the cross of the Calvary of Jesus Christ. Jesus sums all these commands into love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus invites you to come to him today. He says, I am the living bread. Do you trust him that he will provide your needs? Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. Do you trust him with all your life solely dependent on him? Do you trust the Lord who says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I gave my son Jesus to die for you, for your sins, to redeem you and give you everlasting life. Do you desire for more of Jesus? We come to the cross today and surrender to him and be satisfied only in him. And close your eyes and examine your hearts. The Holy Spirit is talking to you today. Are you far away from him? Are you drifted away during this season? Jesus says, come to me. Is the fear gripping you? Are you going through a lot of pain? Are you wondering how I'm going to navigate this season of pandemic that we are in? Jesus says, come to me. Are you angry or tired with what's going on in our country? With so much of hatred and racial injustice and political divisions. Jesus says, come to me. Instead of looking things from outside, can you look 
up towards him like what Moses did. Let's pray and ask the Lord, Lord, teach me your way that I may know you more. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this time, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today very clearly. Instead of seeking this world and desiring for this more of this world, Lord, you're asking us to seek you more of you during this time. During the time of the trouble and calamity, Lord, you are our refuge, you are our strength, you are our fortress, and you are our salvation, and you are our present help in our needs. Lord, I pray for my dear brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray blessings on them, Lord Jesus. Lord, bless their families and children and elders, Lord, with your joy and peace and your strength, Lord. Let your face shine upon each and every one of the families, Lord. Help us, Lord, to desire for more of you. Help us to, to be thirst for more of you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything. Thank you for your son, of, son Jesus, who died on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that David reminded us that Jesus is our supreme satisfaction and that Jesus invites us to come to it. I'm really excited about celebrating communion with you today. So in your home, why don't you gather all the things uh, that we'll be using for communion. And as you're doing that, I'd like to just review a little bit of where we've been over the last 10 weeks. Life is a highway. You know, we've learned so much about how wonderful and how good for us are God's commands, as Brad said, his guardrails. You know, God wants us to flourish. He doesn't want us to flounder. And he intends for us to travel this highway of life so that we can experience this flourishing life. I want you to imagine with me just, just for a minute that we're traveling down this highway of life and we see something in the middle of the road. And as we draw closer, it's gigantic. There's no way around it. There's no way around, there's no way over, there's no way under. Now we can make a decision to turn around and go back the other way and try to find another highway, but we know in our heart of hearts that God wants us to travel this highway. So what is it that's in the middle of the road? What is it that's blocking our way? Well, it's, it's a cross. And we're wrong. It's not blocking our way. It actually is the way onto the highway. It's our way onward. You know, it's so important for us to remember that as we travel this highway, we're gonna get distracted. We're gonna run into the guardrails and we're probably, we're gonna end up in the ditch. But that's why we so desperately need the cross. We need the cross to remind us of the way of God. And we also need the cross to keep us on course. You know, this, this immense cross reminds us that every step of the way we're gonna need daily doses of God's grace, of his love, of his mercy, because, I mean, let's face it, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna fall, well, and we are gonna fail. But remember this, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes through the Father except through me. So Jesus invites us to come to him, through him, to the Father. So as we take communion, I want us to see Jesus and experience Jesus. So if I may, I just wanna show us how we can see Jesus in the supper. So we see bread. Well, Jesus reminds us that he is the bread of life. 
And he says, I am the bread of life and all who come to me will not go hungry. We also look at this bread and you can see stripes on it. We're reminded that before Jesus was crucified, that he was whipped until his back was a bloody mess. The Bible says that by his stripes, we are healed. You also look at this bread, you may not be able to see it, but there are puncture marks, there are little holes in it. Jesus' hands and his feet were nailed to the cross. And a spear, the edge of the spear, opened his side. The Bible tells us that he was pierced through for our transgressions. You know, I can take a piece of this bread and I can crush it pretty easily. The Bible tells us that he was crushed for our iniquities and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Beloved, we need to see Jesus. We need to experience Jesus because it's life is not about us. It's all about Jesus. On the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread probably something similar to this. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take it, eat it, remembering me. Then he also took the wine it's actually in the Passover meal, it's called the cup of thanksgiving. And Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Take it, drink it, remembering me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we've heard today, you are our supreme satisfaction. Oh, how our hearts go after so many things that are of lesser value. But God, is, we're about to sing this song that you are, your presence is like the very air that we breathe. Every breath we need to take every day. Oh God, we need your presence in our lives every day. As we sing this song, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our all-sufficient Savior. In your name we pray, amen. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily bread This is my daily
so much for joining us for worship today. My prayer is that those words, Lord, I need you, would become the prayer of our hearts this week. And as we seek God, I trust that he is going to meet us right there. Faith Church, if there is any way that we can serve you or be praying for you right now, we would love to. The easiest way for you to let us know that is by texting the word CONNECTIONS to 97000. One of the things that has sustained us during these uncertain times is your generosity. As always, you can give online by text or by mail. My prayer is that God shines his face on you, Faith Church. I'll see you again next week right here.